Christ like a candle's glow is waiting now to come inside as he did so long ago. Jesus brings forth of truth and life and makes them bloom and grow. So Wow, what a wonderful way to begin our worship. Welcome everyone this morning. Just a reminder as we begin that this service is being live streamed. And so if there's anyone who doesn't feel comfortable to be in the live stream, if you sit over in that area of the church, then you're not likely to be caught by the camera. The main people the camera sees are those who are at the front and just the backs of heads in any case. But if there is anyone who doesn't feel comfortable, feel free at an opportunity to move to somewhere where you're not going to be seen by the camera. We're going to light our third Advent candle today. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord is my strength and my song. God has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. We light the third candle of Advent, the candle of joy. Jesus, light of our world, we hope for change in our own lives and in your world. We watch and work and wait together for joy. Amen. Among the poor, among the proud, among the persecuted, among the privileged, Christ is coming. He is coming to make all things new. In the private house, in the marketplace, in the wedding feast, in the judgment hall, Christ is coming. He is coming to make all things new. With a gentle touch, with an angry word, with a clear conscience, with burning love, Christ is coming. He is coming to make all things new. That the kingdom might come, that the word might believe, that the powerful might stumble, that the humble might be raised, Christ is coming. He is coming to make all things new. Within us, without us, among us, before us, in this place, in every place, for this time, for all time, Christ is coming. He is coming to make all things new. O come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Let us stand and sing together from Together in Song number 316, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Together in Song number 316.
Welcome once again. Welcome once again to worship this morning on the third Sunday of Advent. A special welcome to the Kingston Chorus. It is wonderful to have you here to bless us with your music. Um, we've already enjoyed one song from them, but they will be singing at a couple of other times in the service, and we're very thankful to have them with us. Also, a special welcome if you are visiting with us this morning. It's wonderful to have visitors to our congregation, and we hope you will feel a very warm welcome from all of us. Everyone is invited to join us for morning tea in the hall, the middle hall at the back. And I hear a whisper that there might be some special treats out there this morning. I think Jill's been a bit busy, so we've got some lovely treats for us to enjoy. So please come and enjoy time together and some special treats as well. My name is Kate Trethaway and I am the worship leader this morning being ably assisted by my three children, Amy, Marison and Josh. Our preacher today is Malcolm Rawlings and in addition to the Kingston Chorus, we also have Graham on bringing us our music. Roy will be our Bible reader and we've got Daryl and... Not Daryl, <laughs> Ron and Brian are doing our um, AV and video this morning. So thank you to them and to all those who assist in enabling our worship to occur. There are lots of people who do little jobs behind the scenes, all of which contribute to us being able to gather together in worship today. Now I believe Malcolm has an announcement. Thanks, Kate. Um, good morning. Uh, just two brief announcements. Um, the, tis the season to be busy, and life is uh, busy, and lots of things are happening, and everyone's telling us to be happy and rejoice and be glad, and that's great. However, sometimes when we stop and pause, we think that I don't feel too happy at the moment, or I'm anxious, or I'm concerned, or there are a number of fears and worries around. And uh, for some of us, there are times when Christmas becomes a sad reflection because someone who we normally anticipate to be with us is no longer here. Or we may feel and reflect about those who are continuing to struggle and suffer, not only in the pandemic, but also in many countries where there is still persecution um, and abuse. So next Saturday evening at 5 p.m., we will have a remembering Christmas service here. It will be quiet, it will be reflective, it won't be live streamed. Uh, there will be an opportunity for us to come in the midst of all the joy and the extrovert of Christmas, um, just to pause and to reflect and uh, to light a candle in remembrance of those or even our own fear and grief. So you are invited next Saturday, the 18th, um, at 5 p.m. here in our church. Sunday morning, of course, we will continue uh, in our worship, Sunday the 19th. Uh, and then in the afternoon, um, we will have our last revive service for, for, a, for this year. Uh, and that's a, a, a different, reflective, creative, reviving service. Uh, and I'll be leading, leading that. It starts at four, four for some lovely coffee, tea, cake, refreshments. Uh, that's also in the middle hall, not in this building, but in the middle hall where a more quiet, intimate and relaxed setting is. Uh, and I'll be uh, leading that revived service. The creativity that we're focusing on, um, on next Sunday will be silence. Now, I know you might find that hard to imagine how I could be doing that. <laughs> But we will be looking at WWW, which is worship without words. We'll be reflecting and seeing how we can engage with the divine, with each other in an attitude of worship as silently and as quietly as possible. Um, and you, with the use of images uh, and music. So uh, feel free to come along. That's next Sunday, the 19th, starting at four. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. Are there any other notices this morning? Okay, we're going to move into our time of prayers of praise, thanksgiving and confession. Let us pray. Loving God, we come before you today filled with thanks for the many ways you have moved and continue to move among us. 
We give you thanks for the way you have moved among us in our own lives and within our church community. We give you thanks for the new ministry opportunities that have arisen within our community. We give you thanks for signs of new life and miracles that have happened in our lives. We give you thanks for answered prayers and for prayers that have been answered in unexpected ways. We give you thanks for the movement of your spirit among us, helping us to reach out to the wider community. We give you thanks for those who have taken on leadership roles within our community and for those who serve quietly behind the scenes. We give you thanks for those who faithfully pray for our community and the individuals within it, carrying us before your throne of grace. We give you thanks. And yet in the midst of our thankfulness, we are mindful of our need to confess to you. Merciful God, most of the time we see ourselves as nice people who are trying to do the loving thing in a difficult world. We try not to lie, cheat, malign, abuse or injure others. We try to serve you through the church and within the community. We pray for peace and justice and we attempt to forgive those who sin against us. By the standards of love in the wider community, we've not done so badly. Yet deep within, we know how far we fall short of the example of love set by Jesus. We feel compromised and misled by this hustling world with its glitter. We become frustrated and undermined by a negativity within ourselves which diverts us and leads us into withholding love. Loving God, we need your pardoning grace and humbly we ask for it. But we need much more. We seek the grace of self-honesty and a sharper awareness of our own hearts. We need your illuminating light to help us see through the humbug of society. We need to be saturated with your love. We ask for the stirring of your spirit to make us more eager for the art of true loving and more determined to practice what we preach. Grant us these graces, we pray. Amen. Amen. God is merciful and gracious, abounding in steadfast love. God does not hold our offences against us, but forgives us again and again. We are forgiven. We can begin anew. Thanks be to God. And let us stand and sing together. Go tell it on the mountain. Please stand and sing.
over the past few weeks we've been watching some videos and today we're looking at the shepherds. It's a modern representation of a gentleman taking on the role of a shepherd uh, and imagining what his conversation might be. He presents to us a little bit of the heritage of the shepherds that uh, is there in the scriptures that but we may not have been fully aware of. Uh, and it's only a snippet of the full video, so I've cut him short before he talks about the priests. So let's uh, watch uh, our friend on the video. Abraham, father of the Hebrew nation, Father Abraham. Did you know he was a banker? No, just joking. He was a priest. Nope, joking again. What did the mighty Father Abraham do? He was a nomadic shepherd. He had other kinds of animals too, but he was a sheep herder. Jacob renamed Israel and his sons. They were rich. They were probably bankers or lawyers, right? No, shepherds. In fact, when they settled in Egypt, the Pharaoh and Joseph sent them to the faraway, remote, sparse lands of Goshen because that land was bad for farmers, but good for shepherds. Egyptians despised shepherds. Moses, greatest of all the prophets, giver of the law. Surely he was a trained banker, lawyer, judge. No, shepherd. For 40 years, when he saw the, the burning bush, tending sheep. Stunning coincidence, three of the greatest Jewish men of all time, revered by every Jew. They were all shepherds. Throughout most of time, light was only provided by the sun, moon, and crude lamps. Very few jobs required a regular night shift. One special night, being a vigilant shepherd had an unfathomable benefit. Now let's discuss King David, the preeminent king of Israel. Maybe the richest man who ever lived. The blessed Messiah is supposed to come from his family. Prior to being a king, King David was surely a banker, lawyer, judge, doctor. You know where I'm going with this. Politician, CEO, maybe he traded stocks and bonds. No, 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 and no. And no. Not only was David a shepherd, he thought of himself in that way even after he was king. The four greatest, most influential, infamous, illustrious, renowned Jewish men in the history of our people. Shepherds, all shepherds. With that in mind, you would guess that the Jews of my day revere shepherds. Now let's talk about priests.
from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. There were shepherds camping in the neighbourhood. They had set night watches over their sheep. Suddenly God's angels stood among them and God's glory blazed around them. They were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A saviour has just been born in David's town. A saviour who is Messiah and Master. This is what you're to look for. A baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. At once the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises, glory to God in the heavenly heights, peace to all men and women on earth who please him. As the angel choir withdrew into heaven, the shepherds talked it over. Let's get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. They left running and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Seeing was believing. They told everyone they met what the angels had said about this child. All who heard the shepherds were impressed. Mary kept all these things to herself, holding them dear deep within herself the shepherds returned and let loose glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen it turned out exactly the way they'd been told this is the gospel of the Lord The Christmas story is a lovely story. It's a familiar story. We've heard it over and over and over again. We've heard some challenges today as the choir has brought to us their previous um, anthem of Mary, did you know? Mary, were you fully aware of what your son was capable of, of what his role would be? There's something of ignorance in Mary's birthing of Jesus. And yet, nine months earlier, that ignorance is not overshadowed by her willingness and her vulnerability to say to the messenger of God, let it be as you will. The opportunity of not knowing completely what was in store, of having some idea that it wasn't going to be clear sailing and an easy path, but Mary still chose to open her life and her heart to say, yes, God, whatever. The story of Christmas is familiar and uh, it touches something of the warmth in our heart. The first uh, song, the introit that the choir brought to us today, spoke about Christmas not being Christmas until it's Christmas in your heart. And that can be a, a lovely thought, and it can be warming and encouraging, but also beware. Because like Mary, in that opportunity of opening and being vulnerable to God's presence, to God's action, to God's activity in your life, yes, it can bring peace to all men and women who please him, as the angels told the shepherds. But it can also bring challenge and energy and vitality and struggle and joy and conflict and pain and comfort. It brings all of life. It's like as if adding all the colours, taking away the veil, taking away the filter and allowing our lives to shine and be all that God intended, allowing us to be all that God created us to be. And that's not easy. While we might dream about that, most of us like to keep comfortable and like to keep just that edge a little below so that we don't stand out too much or so that we don't interfere too much and that nobody attacks us. 
Yet the truth of the Christmas story is God being present in our world and in our life to enable and enhance the people who come across God, the people who take an opportunity to look and seek and to see what is happening around them, people who take an opportunity to be brave enough to allow themselves to shine to allow themselves to be good and to do good and to excel in who they are and what they have. That's something of the challenge that Christmas, over the last few weeks, those who've been attending our services here will have heard me use the sentence that Christmas is a verb. It's a noun, it's an event that happened over 2,000 years ago. It's an event that happens in our culture, and our society on the 25th of December. Although it seems to be growing out because the mince pies seem to be appearing in the supermarkets earlier and earlier. So there's some financial incentive to try and make the noun of Christmas broader. But the truth is that Christmas is a verb as well. The carol we began with, O Little Town of Bethlehem, one of those verses, one of the lines in the last verse, speaks to us, may Christ be born in us today. Don't let's come to the manger scene and pause and remember. Don't let us just do that. Let us see there's an opportunity for the reality of Christ God being present, flesh and bone in our world, can happen here today, can happen here in your heart and in your life. While the first song that the choir sang was lovely and beautiful, we enjoyed it, we appreciated it. Some of us wanted to put our hands together to, to clap their efforts and their musical ability. Let's look beyond that and see the truth of those words that Christmas isn't Christmas unless it's Christmas in your heart. Not just as a hallmark card greeting, but the reality, the incredibility of God actually being present in you in your life, in your body, in your actions, in your thoughts, in your day. Not just when we've sort of dressed up and smartened up to come to church, to worship in community where everyone can see us, but in those early mornings when we're stirring and the sleep is combating and we're trying to rise out of the unconsciousness of the night before, God present there. Our first thought as we wake, may that be recognizing that we are here and that God is here, God and I together. And what are we going to do with this day today? What are, is God and I going to do today? That's the reality of the incarnation. That's the reality of God being born amongst us, showing the possibility that God is blessing our world, our creation, that God always has, and that God wants to engage with us daily. But we're talking about shepherds, and we're reflecting on the words of the, the video of the gentleman who pointed out the, the leaders, the heroes, the archetypes of the Jewish faith were all shepherds, all of those who engaged in caring for the flocks. When we look at the scriptures, we see that there are many images of God, and sometimes we reflect on God as a shepherd. The 23rd Psalm is one of the most favorite in our um, culture. The Lord is my shepherd. We have other images of God. Sometimes we like to think of God as a king, God as a carpenter, God as a gardener, God as someone who cares and nurtures. 
Sometimes we even ponder and think that God, in God's creativity, can be like a mother to us as well. But for today, we're reflecting on God as shepherd and the way in which the shepherds were, despite their task of caring for the sheep. Did you pick up how he was pointing towards the time of the people when Christ was born, how shepherds were revered? No. Down the bottom of the rung, shepherds seem to have been one of the lowest of the low. And again, it shouldn't be surprising that our God uses those people who were unexpectedly seen to be of influence. God came and spoke to a young girl and told her that she would be the vessel for his engagement and involvement in the world. God came and spoke to an older couple who had been childless for many, many years. God came and spoke to a young carpenter in an out-of-the-way town, not in the busy cities. God didn't come to the temple. God went to a little manger. There's something that we take for granted, that God works in ways that we cannot understand, that God uses insignificant and unimportant people, and yet we struggle to see that God would want to use us. And in reality, when we look at the big picture, the things that we do, the activities that we have day after day after day are in the great scheme of things reasonably insignificant and unimportant. And yet God desires to participate and engage in our life. God chooses to use you in your context with all your gifts and foibles, with all your strengths and areas of growth that God wants to be present in you and with you. As we follow that story that Roy read to us, we hear not only the amazing visit of the angels, but the intention of the shepherds. What do we do with this experience? What do we do with the incredible visit into our field and flock of these heavenly messengers Seeing is believing. They discussed that they would move and act upon what they'd been told. They chose not just to sit and theorize about it. They didn't go to theological college. They didn't form a group and a committee and work out what the next steps would be. They decided there and then, here's an opportunity, let's go. And they went that night and they found what they had been told. And it touched their hearts so amazingly that they could not stop talking about it. The, the words that Roy read said, the shepherds let loose. They went and it just bubbled over. I'm sure all of us in our lives may reflect upon an experience that we had that was overwhelming, something that touched us, and we needed to tell someone else about it. We just bubbled over. The story of that night with the shepherds was that they were just overwhelmed by the reality and the majesty and the truth of what they had discovered, and so they went and shared it. And the following day, they were still bubbling over. And if anybody would listen, they would tell them. And the next day, they would again tell anybody who would listen. And then after a week, some of them were still telling. And then after a month, they found that there were not as many people who were interested in hearing this same old story again and again. After six months, after 12 months... It took 30 years for that baby to grow and to start to have a public ministry in that area. 30 years is a long time to hold on to that explosive, energetic, imaginative, creative moment. What do you do with that? How do you 
continue on. Yes, it's touched you and it's changed you, but then there are times when maybe you began to doubt that it actually happened. Because that baby didn't grow up in that place. They weren't even sure if the baby got away because there were some strange visitors who came and visited the house where Mary and Joseph had set up. And the young boy was worshipped. But then the family left. And the shepherds no longer heard what was going on. 30 years is a long time. In a few weeks, my wife and I will celebrate our 43rd wedding anniversary. I can still remember some of the things that happened on our wedding day. I still remember some of my fears and anxieties. I still remember looking at my bride. I still remember some of the things that didn't go to plan. I still remember the opportunity of taking this person to be part of my life. I'm sure if you have an experience that you can look back over many years, there are some things that you can remember and some things you can celebrate. But there's a challenge to try and find anybody who wants to hear. There's a challenge who, to find anybody who wants to see the same emotion and joy that, that you have from that event. But the reality is that 43 years after that first day, there is still love and value and appreciation and respect and awe and wonder, but not every day. Some days it's quite ordinary. Some days it's frustrating. Ask my wife, she'll tell you. But something continues on. But I can't go around living back on the 13th of January 1979. I can't keep living back to that moment because I live here and now. And the truth of Christmas, like my wedding is a noun, but my marriage is a verb. And I have to live here and now with the person who I committed my life to. The truth of the story of Christ being born in Bethlehem, that God is ready, engaged in our world, shows to us that that's had an impact and it's touched my life at some point. Some point Christmas became Christmas in my heart where I acknowledged that Jesus was born for me and in me. And so there's an opportunity for us to live and reflect in that day after day after day. I celebrate my wedding anniversary, but I don't live in that ceremony. I live here and now. is a challenge for us as we would pause and reflect upon Christ being born in us today. How can we do that? How can we live that out day by day by day? And part of it is recognizing that in the ordinary, insignificant, unimportant moments of our lives, God still is present and God engages with us. As we leave our church today, there'll be an opportunity for you to take a little bookmark. At the top of it, it says Christmas is a verb. And there are some dot points on there. So put it on your fridge, on the bedside table, in your Bible. But if you put it in your Bible, make sure it's the Bible that you look at, not the Bible that sits on the shelf. Christmas is a verb. First point says, say... Good morning, Lord. Or some phrase like that to acknowledge that when you wake, you and God are in this together and there's an opportunity for you to listen and respond and engage. 
Think of those people that you will meet today. How can you show God's love to them? How can you encourage them? Is there anyone you feel you should reach out to today? Phone, email, or visit? Is there some way you can serve God today, be in God's hands or feet? And is God wanting you to offer your services to some group or organization? And there's some space at the bottom of the bookmark, and there's a whole blank side for you to maybe even write your own conversation on your own thoughts or something that you think is important for you daily to pause and reflect and to see that my life, God in me, has an impact today, here and now. During this season of Advent, we uh, invite you to join with the National Council of Churches in Australia in supporting the Christmas Bowl Appeal, which helps people around the world who are struggling in various ways. One of the projects involves Sri Lanka. The next image on the screen is of Daniel and his family who've returned to Sri Lanka. Daniel was a young man when he and his parents fled the conflict in Sri Lanka for a refugee camp in India. More than a decade later, he was still in the camp with a wife and four children of his own. But without the freedoms of a citizen, Daniel often struggled to feed his family. When his oldest daughter fell sick with a heart condition, life became even harder. Thankfully, Daniel could turn to the local Christmas Bowl partner the Organisation for Elam Refugees Rehabilitation, or OFFA. With the help of your generosity, OFFA cares for Sri Lankan refugees in India and supports them to return home after decades in exile. The next image shows Danielle's children. OFFA helped Danielle's family obtain the correct documentation, such as birth certificates, for their children and make, to make citizenship applications. Those birth certificates seem almost as large as the children themselves. On returning to Sri Lanka, OFFA helped them access government services such as health care, and they also supported Daniel to build a business to support his family. Daniel remembers how it felt to be back on Sri Lankan soil after 12 long years away. He said, I experienced boundless joy. First, meeting my parents and other relatives, then returning to our own house in our own country. Sadly, the COVID-19 crisis has put this joyful dream further out of reach for Sri Lankans still living in crowded refugee camps in India. Border closures have stopped them from travelling back to Sri Lanka. On the next slide, young people are reminding me that we have a Christmas bowl, which I keep forgetting to bring forward. The one that's been ornately done some years ago with all sorts of individual people showing on it who benefit from the Christmas Bowl appeal. Your gifts will help offers teams keep Sri Lankan refugees safe from COVID-19. You'll provide medicine and food to people who need to isolate and protective gear to offer health workers. And you'll help more families like Daniel's return home to Sri Lanka and build new lives once this emergency is over. Thank you for prayerfully considering how you might help Sri Lankan families overcome their most urgent challenges. Since the advent of COVID, we no longer pass um, offering bags around. Many of us now give electronically and for others of us we give in, there's a box at the back of the church where people are able to give their offerings. Um, but it's still important that we take the time to dedicate the offerings that we give as, give as a gift to God. So let us now pray and dedicate our offerings to God. 
Sometimes we believe the gifts we offer do not matter, but when they are combined with all the other gifts of healing, of hope, of compassion, of your heart, they can become rivers of grace and justice flowing through the lives of everyone around us. We offer our gifts to you in this hope as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We will now move into our times of prayers of the people and there will be moments of silence throughout the prayer for reflection um, and time to give your prayers to God. So let's pray. Be still and let your thoughts wander to the person who is or has been closest and dearest to you. Think of their face, the way they smile, the tone of their voice, the sound of their laughter. In the quietness now, let God know how much you have appreciated the quality of this relationship you have shared and how grateful you are that this person has enriched your living experience during your time here on earth. Think of somebody else you are fond of, perhaps someone in your family, perhaps a friend or neighbour or a work colleague. Think of their shape, their height, their weight. Then think of their character, their nature, their ways. In the quietness, let God know how much you have enjoyed sharing your life with that person. Mention the pleasure you have received in knowing them and the sense of satisfaction you have experienced simply because they have been themselves, simply because of the person they are. And now, think of someone you have had no contact with whatsoever. Look at the face of the hungry child. Look at the young man injecting a vein. Look at the woman, homeless and huddled in a corner. Look at the grandfather ending his days in a bed. Look at the rich man exploiting his workers. Speak to God now. Ask God to show you what you could do to establish new relationships so you can feed the hungry, support the weak, befriend the lonely, change the hearts of the proud and careless, for we are God's hands and his feet, and God depends on us now to share his love so that our living and the living of others might be full. God, you are love. May we live in your love so your love might be set free, so your love touches each and liberates all. And now let us pray together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now join with us as we sing all together now, 33, for unto us a child is born. Well, why don't we join with me and uh, thank the choir today. (laughs) 
It has been a blessing to have Margaret and the Kingston Chorus to share with us, to add that uh, gift of music uh, and praise to God uh, in our service. Thank you too for Graham for the extra extra service of uh, accompanying the, the group as well as providing our, our um, musical support for our normal worship. Thank you for that extra, extra part. Um, as Kate uh, informed us early on in the service, there's some lovely things out the back uh, to share with, so you are warmly welcome to come and join us in the middle hall uh, to share in morning tea and coffee. Uh, and there'll be an opportunity as we leave um, the, the building to, uh, to acknowledge and uh, take a bookmark, um, if you desire, uh, so that there can be an opportunity to remind ourselves day by day of how God is present in our lives. So if you would like to stand... So we acknowledge that God's goodness is in our lives. We celebrate and remember the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. So let us go out into the world like the shepherds to share the news that Christ is born, that Christ is born today, that Christ is born in me. And may we be open and vulnerable enough to live that out one day at a time one step at a time. So go in God's name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.